Welcome to Worth Live. Thank you all for joining the next episode in this special six-part education series with our partner New Profit, where we're talking about re-architecting the future through philanthropy and social entrepreneurship. Firstly, I hope you and your loved ones are keeping well during what has and continues to be a challenging time for so many people. I'm Juliet Scott Crop with Sea at Worth Media and I'm delighted to be joined by our special guest today, Sarah Dello, Executive Director for Alliance for Youth Organising, Vanessa Tucker, Programme Officer at William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and Tristan Wilkinson, Managing Principal at Think Rubix, and also Leila Zane, Executive Director and COO at Millennial Action Project. We're also joined today by our moderator, Yodanus EOL, partner at New Profit. So I wanted to say a warm welcome to you all. Hi, everyone. Before we begin, I, I just want to take a moment to offer our condolences to the family, friends and colleagues of Leila Vila, who passed away tragically two weeks ago. Leila was a lifetime, uh, long time leader on equity in education through her work at Education Leaders of Colour and participated in our earlier panel on this series on education and her words and her example were powerful and will remain with us. So uh, our, our sincere condolences to, to Layla's family and friends. Our intention uh, at Worth is to create conversations that help inspire and inform and activate our community, many of whom are investors, funders, entrepreneurs and leaders who want to leave a positive impact on the world and to help to create a more inclusive and equal economy and society for the benefit of everyone. And we call that Worth Beyond Wealth. So, so we hope you enjoy this session and we hope you find it valuable. This education series is all about breakthrough impact and, and philanthropy like other sectors face, is facing a moral reckon, reckoning on racial equality and continues to have a, a vital role to play in creating an America that lives up to the promises of its founding ideals. We must overcome the barriers and the biases that have existed in philanthropy for too long if we hope to unlock the ideas and the talent and the collaborations that can drive us towards a more equitable future. And in this, in this session, we'll be discussing how we can use a new lens to see and invest in transformative change in democracy. It feels like a very timely topic, uh, given the events of, of the past few weeks that continue. The glue for an inclusive, healthy and responsive democracy like a healthy relationship is trust. And um, democracy requires trust in the political apparatus such as Congress, as well as trust between its people. Uh, however, the state of trust in, in our country is, is low. And according to Pew Research Center, 35% of Americans are low trusters who believe that people cannot be trusted and only look at their own self-interest. And interestingly, among this group of Americans, 40% believe we're overreacting to the COVID-19 crisis. So we're thrilled to be joined by leaders in their field and social entrepreneurs today, Sarah Adrello, Vanessa Tucker, Tristan Wilkinson, uh, Leila Zidane, as well as um, uh, Jordanus, to share their perspectives on how we can build innovative models to repair or dismantle the broken systems in our democracy to create a more inclusive, healthy and responsive democracy grounded in trust. So before I hand over a few housekeeping rules, um, thank you all so much for attending. It's great to see some, some new faces on here as well as some returning ones. We really do welcome questions and comments from you. If you change your chat function to all panelists and attendees, please do share any comments or questions you have for the speakers on there. We'll weave it into the conversation and we'll also have time at the end to, uh, to cover those questions as well. So would encourage you to share your thoughts and questions as we go. Um, without further ado, I'm thrilled to introduce Yodanis EOL, who's partner at New Profit. In her role, Yodanis leads the vision, strategy, development and management of New Profit's Catalyze Investments portfolio. This entails developing a, a pipeline of high potential organisations leading investment selection and designing and facilitating cohort based learning communities to build the capacity of portfolio organisations. In 2019, Yodanis launched Civic Lab as part of New Profits Catalyze Investments Portfolio to invest in organizations led by visionary democracy entrepreneurs that are working to create civic 
trust and inclusive democracy. Yolanda's hi, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Juliet. Uh, we're so excited, uh, myself and my colleagues on Nonprofit, to partner with Worth Media and, and host this series, including uh, today's very, very timely discussion on how we can create transformative change in our democracy. Uh, for those who are newer to New Profit, we are a national venture philanthropy organization. We back breakthrough social and democracy entrepreneurs who are advancing equity and opportunity in America. And as Juliet mentioned, I'm a partner at New Profit and as part of our early stage investments portfolio, uh, I also lead uh, Civic Lab and our civic engagement strategy to build civic trust and an inclusive democracy in our country. During this historic election, we have seen both the power and resiliency of our democratic process. We have also seen the systemic and structural challenges that continue to threaten our ability to have a robust and healthy and inclusive democracy. On the one hand, we had major democracy victories, including historic voter turnout with 160 million people. That means that two thirds of all Americans who are eligible to vote participated in this election and our panelists will talk about that. Uh, Virginia passed Amendment 1, ending partisan gerrymandering. California passed Proposition 17, restoring the right to vote to people convicted of felonies who are on parole. And of course, we had major victories for representation, including Vice President-elect Kamala Harris, uh, as well as Cori Bush, the first Black woman to represent a state of Missouri in Congress, and many, many others. At the same time, we have deep systemic and structural challenges that have been exposed, such as voter suppression and intimidation tactics, as well as rudimentary infrastructure, right, for a multimodal and efficient election process. And as Juliet already mentioned, we also as a country have suffered from a crisis of trust that has been exacerbated by divisive narrative and misinformation. And even before this election, only 17% of Americans trusted the government. And uh, we as a people have become increasingly distrustful of each other. So with this understanding of persistent systemic issues, we launched New Profit Civic Lab in 2019. And our work is really grounded in three values. First, we believe democracy entrepreneurs who represent the diversity of our country should be at the helm of leaving efforts to transform the civic destiny of our country. Two, we need to invest in the long game, not only during election cycles. And then three, we need breakthrough solutions that target the underlying structural and systemic conditions that have contributed to disenfranchisement in our democracy. And our civic engagement work is further complemented by our policy and advocacy work through America Ford, as well as our inclusive impact action tank. And I'm so thrilled uh, to have with us leading proximate democracy entrepreneurs and philanthropists for this discussion. And in this conversation, we'll talk about the incredible work they lead. Uh, we'll talk, they'll help us process and make sense of the election. Uh, and from their proximate vantage point, we'll talk about how philanthropy can be a force for strengthening our democracy. Um, so I'll start out by asking our panelists a few questions. And then as Juliet mentioned, we also want you to be a part of this conversation. So uh, feel free to chat uh, your questions and comments either through the Q&A function or the chat function. So with that, uh, I'm so thrilled to welcome uh, Leila, Sarah, Tristan, and Vanessa. Uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. And I would like to start by asking you all, you know, as democracy entrepreneurs and philanthropists, you all have played critical roles in this election, whether by organizing at the grassroots level, working with elected officials, or by mobilizing resources to ensure that we have a safe, secure, and fair election. From your particular vantage point, how are you making sense of this election and its outcome? And, and what are your early reflections? And I would love to, to hear from each of you. And, and maybe, Sarah, you could get us started. Awesome. Thanks so much, Yordanos, and thank you so much to Worth Media for the invitation to, to participate. Um, so my name is Sarah Adalo. I run a network of youth-led and focused organizations called the Alliance for Youth Organizing. And in the lead up to the 2020 election, uh, the organizations and our network have been working 365 days a year, 24 hours a day to engage young people in our democracy, in a democracy that too often uh, pushes them out, ignores them, or makes it really, really 
really hard to participate. And so since the 2016 election, there's been a few things that we've been really focusing on. One, uh, growing our network. Uh, every young person in the United States, every young person in the world should have a political home in their communities. Me, I'm originally from Bakersfield, California, and I had to leave my hometown to learn how to organize to make change in my communities. You shouldn't have to leave your home to be able to make change in your home. And so we're working to support young people in developing their own political homes across the country. And those groups are also doing really important work to one, register a ton of young people to vote. That's been work that has to happen 365 days a year. It mostly and is it's most effective happening in the field versus online. Um, and when, when the pandemic hit, thank goodness we had three years of voter registration that had been happening. So that kind of cushion, the, the hit we knew was coming uh, with having to move everything remote. Um, our folks have been working to change laws to make democracy more accessible, um, making sure that more states have automatic voter registration or pre-registration for 17-year-olds who turn 18 by the election, getting more polling places in communities, expanding hours where those polling places are open, making vote by mail accessible. So changing the laws in each state and community around how our democracy functions. And then of course, keeping young people engaged on the issues they care about, whether it was getting police kicked out of uh, public, Milwaukee public schools. That's something our group in Wisconsin did this summer which was incredibly powerful in a campaign they had been working on for years. Um, we're working to make sure that in states like Oregon, where everything is vote by mail, that paid postage um, is covered so that those who don't act, have access to stamps or a low income can get their ballots turned in um, no, like without, uh, without a burden. And so that's work that we've been doing alongside our folks for the past few years. And we're so excited to see that at a minimum, we will have seen a five point increase in youth turnout from 2016. It could be as high as 10 points. And so we're waiting for the data to come back, which won't be in until next year, sadly. But young people made their voices heard their election, this election, and we're so, so proud of them and grateful for them. Such incredible work, Sarah. Um, how about you, Layla? Yeah, well, just echoing Sarah, thank you, Jordana and Worth Media for, for having us. My name is Layla. I uh, run Millennial Action Project, which is a, an organization working with young elected officials at both the congressional and state levels to bridge the partisan divide and, and transform American politics by investing in this new generation of leaders. And, you know, it's a unique mission because it's about creating this civic in infrastructure that Jordana's discussed at the beginning of this panel and, and investing in that infrastructure, which despite a diversity of perspectives and opinions, we can all understand that at the end of the day, we're all on the same team and we're all here to solve problems together. And we've noticed that millennials and, and Gen Z in particular are especially able to put issues at the forefront and rise above party labels to get things done. Um, and, and as that relates to this election, you know, the moment that the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we knew we had a unique responsibility to mobilize our network of legislatures, of legislators, excuse me, to, to ensure that this election was safe, that it was secure, that it was fair, and most of all, that people turned out, that people felt that they, are, they had a, an opportunity to, to have their voice heard. Um, and so we worked with bipartisan young legislators across the country on um, reforms to actually make it easier for people to vote by mail, to remove some of the restrictions um, that would have been really dangerous in the middle of a, of a global pandemic, um, and to also use bipartisan voices to build credibility around how secure this election would be. And over the past few days, as I've been reflecting on you know, the outcomes um, and just early kind of takeaways, I think one of the most important things that, that I think I've seen is that at the end of the day, the system worked. Um, to, to have seen the highest turnout ever in election in the middle of a global pandemic is nothing short of astounding. Um, you know, I think we were not able to just have this election, but actually increase access to the ballot um, which thanks to, to organizers on the ground, thanks to elected officials, thanks to elections officials, uh, thanks to funders who are able to move money to actually enhance some of those um, changes and, and infrastructure that we needed. Um, you know, we saw that our underlying system is, is actually pretty strong. And thanks to the work of a lot of the people on this call, a lot of the people not on this call, we were able to make sure that there were some enhancements made in a time of crisis to, to support that, that access. 
Um, you know, our goal now as an organization is to make sure that a lot of these enhancements are not temporary, are not just one-time fixes, but are actually long-term investments in the infrastructure of our democracy to, to continue this trend that we're seeing of more people participating and more people having their voice heard. Um, and, and you know, the, the second thing that, that I would say on, on that point in terms of takeaways from this election is that um, so many people made their voice heard. I think this generation is really redefining what democracy means. Um, you know, Sarah talked about all of the incredible young organizers who have been working for, for years, not just this year around an election, but for years around holding their elected leaders accountable. That only works if you have elected leaders who care what their constituents think. And so it's a virtuous cycle that, that we've been working on to, to create that feedback loop um, and investments on both sides of that equation led to, to big wins. You know, democracy isn't, uh, democracy isn't elections, democracy is what happens in between elections. And, you know, I think we're seeing for the past few years a major shift in how young people in particular are redefining what democracy means. Wow, that's such a, a powerful statement, right? Young people are redefining what, what democracy looks like. Um, Vanessa, I want to come to you. You entered this conversation, obviously, as, as a funder. I'm curious, what are some of your reflections uh, from, from this election season? Oh, thanks. Um, it, it's great to be here with all of you. So I'm Vanessa Tucker. I'm from the Hewlett Foundation's U.S. Democracy Program. Um, you know, my biggest takeaway from this is we saw such incredible organizing and election administration and historic turnout. You know, we were really panicking in April when we already knew that our election system had a lot of vulnerabilities. And then with COVID, it, it was clear that we were going to have an entirely new round of challenges. Um, it feels like a miracle, but it was honestly, it was the complete opposite of a miracle. The elections ran well because a huge number of very diverse organizations built strong localized networks and worked with incredible discipline and focus. Um, they saw what was needed in their communities and they made it happen with real entrepreneurship. And that takes sustained investment in the election off season. So it's not gonna happen again. We can't just call this up every two or four years. It doesn't happen um, unless there's sustained investment, you know, genuine investment over time. And one reflection just on the philanthropy side, and I'll, uh, I'll probably say this again later um, in, in the call is that, you know, I've heard from philanthropists again and again over the past six months that they have a renewed commitment to inclusivity and to supporting BIPOC leaders, which is which is great and very important, of course. I've also heard a concern that you know, smaller and newer organizations, many of which happen to have BIPOC leadership and are more inclusive, that you know, maybe they're not ready for larger scale contributions. This election has proven that to be complete nonsense. That you know, these organizations, the proximate leaders that, that you all fund and that, you know, we, we support through you and, and so many others handled huge and unexpected flows of money with just incredible discipline and entrepreneurship. I mean, they, they really made this happen. So I think that from now on, it's clear that making big unrestricted money bets on these organizations um, is, is really going to pay off because they've proven themselves to be absolutely trustworthy in that in that sense. Thank you, Vanessa. And I know we'll come back to a lot of the themes that you touched on uh, later in this conversation. Uh, Tristan, you your work is uh, predominantly in the South. We'd love to hear your reflections from this election and 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 just some of the early insights that you're hearing from your communities, the communities that you work in as well. Yes, thanks, Yodanos, um, and to uh, to those hosting the call. I'm Tristan Wilkerson, Managing Principal of TR, I think Rubus, we call it TR, uh, but also chair of a couple of sister organizations um, that round out our ecosystem in the Foundation for Social Impact, C3, and the uh, Social Impact Action Fund, C4. Um, I think, you know, just to answer the question right, quite directly, uh, though a lot of our work began in the South, our woke vote work, our civic engagement work uh, began in, in the South where we feel there was a greatest opportunity to, uh, to uh, demonstrate what it really does take to move voters of color in particular, uh, but more broadly, historically disadvantaged voters who have not always had access to the ballot 
um, which also includes our work to support Desmond Mead and the Florida Restoration Coalition in 2018 to expand voting rights to um, formerly convicted uh, individuals. We expanded that work in this past cycle uh, because we knew what was on the line. And I think some of the, the takeaways that I wanna lift up is, um, is, you know, frankly, there was a lot happening in this cycle that no one really was anticipating prior to uh, March of 2020 with COVID in particular. Uh, but what I think is, is really a strong takeaway is that we were ready. And um, a lot of the, our, client, our partners on the ground were also, also ready. What it really took was uh, ingenuity and grit to, to sort of fill in the gaps when we weren't seeing really broad engagement, grassroots engagement because of the pandemic. And, and the question was, is, well, what's the safest thing to do, but also what's the, what's the necessary thing to do? And a lot of folks made some incredible sacrifices to do grassroots work in this cycle to make sure that we turned out um, uh, uh, voters and particularly historically disadvantaged voters in key urban uh, metropolitan areas, mainly Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Atlanta, uh, Detroit, Pittsburgh even. And so, uh, you know, one of the things we really, I think have to, have to appreciate is, uh, is uh, what it took to do that and what would have happened if that work did not happen. Um, and so just to sort of round this out, um, the third party sector, I think, uh, really demonstrated the value of, of its work. And mind you, our woke vote work um, is not born out of just doing grassroots space, but really resourcing an ecosystem. This is, this is an intricate, uh, dynamic set of relationships with, with folks in different places. How do you scale an operation, Sarah and, and Layla can speak to this, across several states? in enough time to make sure that you can target voters and make sure that those voters have the information that they need to feel empowered to participate. That requires having relationships with local leaders, credible messengers, and folks who are doing the work on a year round basis. That's the reason and purpose for the ecosystem is to make sure that we can get the resources where they need to be in a timely manner to make sure that folks are able to participate in democracy. I think beyond that, um, uh, yeah, our preparation and being able to fill in those gaps is also quite extraordinary. Um, but you know, let's just take a moment to appreciate that this election cycle, perhaps one of the greatest takeaways here, is was an exercise in rebuilding trust in democracy. And you know, that's fantastic and really important. But what's to happen next? Voting is but a comma, not a period. So we have to prepare for this next se this season, what we call accountability where we're now rebuilding trust also in government. And that means investing in the ecosystems in the off seasons, in the off cycles, so that the work can continue, the work that we've done to really uh, uh, prepare people to, be, to move and be moved um, can be scaled adequately and appropriately to ensure that they stay engaged. Um, so in that sense, uh, really a lot of strong takeaways. I think we, we have some case studies to evaluate um, coming out of this election, once all the data comes in, I think Pennsylvania is a case study. We've made investments in certain demos that, you know, uh, in a lot of ways, if we had invested some of those resources in historically disadvantaged voters, voters of color, young voters, uh, we may have seen an even, you know, larger turnout and deeper engagement. But I, and I think that has to be part of the goal when we talk about uh, democracy innovation and expanding access uh, to the civic engagement process, but also keeping in mind it's not just the voting piece, it's, in, it's making sure that they're empowered to participate uh, even beyond the election. So I'll leave it there because I know there's more to discuss. Uh, certainly, and, and I wanna bring a thread that Sarah, you talked about helping young people find a political home uh, and the obviously massive U turnout that we saw and will better understand as the data comes out over, over the next year. And then Tristan, you talked about um, being ready as one of the, the key takeaways that you're having from this moment and the ingenuity and the infrastructure and the sheer grit that it took to build an ecosystem of actors, right? Who trust each other, who have relationships with each other that made this historic turnout possible in the midst of a pandemic. I would love, especially for uh, Sarah and, and, and Tristan, for you to comment on looking ahead, right? And now that we're entering the season of accountability, like you said, Tristan, um, what do organizations, what do your organizations, what do organizations like yours need 
in order to continue to build civic power in the communities that you work in. Can you talk a little bit about that, what it actually takes uh, to get this work done in this, in this next phase? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everything that we are focused on right now is trying to make sure that when young people across the country made the decision to vote in this election, that that decision was not a transaction, that it wasn't the I'm a vote and then everything that encouraged me, supported me, loved on me to get me to that place disappears. That is what we're trying to prevent. And so when we look across the country at the groups that we're working with and the really incredible work that they led. I mean, a lot of uh, the groups that we work with, a lot of the young um, youth of color led and focus groups, you know, they have been on the forefront of centering culture and joy in their work amidst a pandemic, amidst a racial reckoning, amidst a, a, a horrific unemployment crisis that is making so many of our families struggle right now. They kept uh, the focus on joy and power and the vision that young people are fighting for. And so when I think about what comes next, you know, I think about the really powerful work that um, one APIA in Nevada, it's an awesome intergenerational uh, Asian American group in Nevada and the, the innovative organizing that they've done to really invest in Asian American young people to make sure that they're registered to vote, that they're mobilizing those young people then to, to then reach uh, families overall, that they're making the work fun, that they have the resources they need to keep building with those young people. I think about you know, in Texas, we've just seen skyrocketing youth turnout happening in Texas. Texas has always been kind of at the lowest of low when it comes to turnout in this country. And for a lot of reasons, it's really hard to register to vote there. It's one of the only states in the country where the state government decided that they're not going to make vote by mail accessible um, so unless you're over the age of 65 in a pandemic and our crew there named Move Texas, they tried to sue the state over that and we lost. And so people were forced basically to vote in person in the middle of a pandemic. And still young people, more of them voted in early vote than in um, an early vote this year than in the entirety of 2016. And so young people are, are, are really just pushed push through those barriers and now they're ready to govern. Now they're ready to hold elected officials accountable to say, yep, we pushed you on these issues and now we're going to make sure that the, the pledges that you made about what you're going to do when you get in office, um, that we're holding you accountable to those promises. We're going to make sure that more young people are getting invested in as leaders for this moment, but then also for the future. Um, we're going to make sure that, you know, uh, I just, when I think about um, the innovation of young folks of color to reach their peers despite a lack of resources. You know, I, I hate to say it, but resources are so important. And an example of why is that last year, um, I had a couple of groups in our network where their budget was about $750,000 last year. This year, one of those organizations, their budget was $3 million. This year, another one of those organizations, their budget was $5 million. And so to Vanessa's point about these youth of color led and focused and centered groups being able to absorb and spend that money, they're absolutely able to do that. But what we anticipate for next year is those resources tanking, which means we're not going to be able to engage those young people that we had engaged with all year, which means that the, the, the actions they had taken can start to feel like a transaction unless we're actually um, able to keep folks on staff, to keep uh, organizing them, to keep training them, to keep investing their leadership to move into the future. And so the, the resource piece, I just, I can't underscore how important it is. Um, I am no longer young. <laughs> I am on the other side. So I, I started off as a youth organizer. I've been in this work for a minute now and have seen what happens after presidential elections, which is resources pull back and groups close their doors. And we've had to rebuild so much infrastructure over the last three years in particular to get to this moment. And right now it's vitally important that we keep that infrastructure alive and thriving and we expand it because actually there are too many states in the country right now where we don't have youth led and focus groups where a lot of that support is just so ad hoc it's volunteer groups that uh Wofo and others are investing in but don't have the resources to keep that that power growing like that's what we need we move more money to the field than ever before this year and i'm so grateful we're able to do that and I don't anticipate us being in that place this year, but that's where we need to be. We need to double down in supporting these groups because the work is not done. And we need to keep all of these young people that we've energized over the last year, part of this process, part of this democracy, so they don't peace out and bounce. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Tristan, what are your thoughts? Yep, I 100% I endorse uh, everything Sarah just mentioned. And in my mind, she's forever young. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, and, and my leader too. Let me let me um, uh, lift up just uh, you mentioned Yodanos earlier, the work that's been done. 
and the, and the fact that folks were prepared. Part of the beauty of the pre-work that goes into organizing and strategy and preparing to move uh, as a democracy entrepreneur is being in relationship with other democracy entrepreneurs, even if their work is beyond the civic engagement scope and maybe has a policy lens or a community engagement lens or some other lens. Um, so, you know, one of the things I wanted to tee up is that uh, one of my partners, Dewana Thompson, uh, who in a lot of ways is the is responsible for woke vote uh, and it's and it's birthing uh, uh, saw fit once we recognize that the grassroots energy that it, that we need, especially on the progressive left, is to uh, uh, that we need to uh, the enthusiasm we need to be able to move folks wasn't there. And a lot of that had to do with the quietness that that COVID caused. Uh, that was harrowing. And she so we we huddled, we saw fit. The first thing we did was was reach out to some of the other democracy entrepreneurs in the space that were moving. And we developed an overnight almost a partnership with Until Freedom, Tamika Malley, Linda Sarsour, and others uh, who were uh, moving uh, in, in a particular space on the grassroots level and decided to do a bus tour across six states within three and a half weeks before the election. That to me is the type of phenomenal response that, that really does underscore the need to make these investments ahead of time in part because none of that was planned before we got here that was that was uh, uh impromptu uh and and necessary because of the events that we were dealing with so that 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 is um you know i can't i just can't underscore enough how important it is to be able to resources where so that those things can happen happen effectively and efficiently in terms of what happens next and what we need to do just a couple of things that I would share. Uh, and we're, we're starting to get into this now. The first I think we need is an equitable post-election analysis, right? A really good hard look at the data and, and understand what the data means without, without bias. Uh, what that should yield and allow us to do is to proliferate an unbiased narrative uh, that recognizes truth. And again, I'm, I'm gonna come back to Pennsylvania because I think a part of the, the, the strategy going into this national election was to say, uh, we're going we're gonna to big tent organize uh, and then COVID hit and that disrupted all of that potential and the third party sector had to move their audiences in order for us to see the type of outcome that we did on Saturday of last week. If Philadelphia did not occur, meaning the folks in Philadelphia, folks in Pittsburgh who are on the ground moving people, same in these other cities, there would have been very much a different outcome. And so it's really important that this analysis, this post-election analysis is equitable and it produces and yields an unbiased narrative that we can share widely and broadly. I think uh, secondly and lastly, um, we should understand that the infrastructure that allows us to do this to Sarah's point is really also very critical uh, to reduce turn turnover in the off season, uh, to make sure that we're investing in ecosystems. I think everybody's organization here, again, represents not just a program, but an ecosystem. Other partners are beneficiaries of the resources that come through um, uh, the Youth Alliance and comes through the Foundation for Social Impact. And that allows them to be stable, to reduce turnover. Um, and, uh, and these are organizations or ecosystems led by folks of color that serve communities broadly and that employ people of color. Uh, those are really important uh, tenants of, of this infrastructure design. Uh, and that last thing I'll share is, you know, one of the benefits of investing in infrastructure, um, particular for third party sector organizations, uh, is that we get a chance to professionalize organizing. And, um, and we also have a chance to develop technology, which does really also improve the efficiency of our work. To be completely frank, some of the tools that are used to do this work um, weren't necessarily made uh, with uh, these type of organizers in mind, the type of work that we do in mind. And so those resources allow us to truly be entrepreneurial and develop technology and to uh, develop other tools that allow us to do this work incredibly well. So I'll, I'll, I'll hush there because I know we have to continue, but can't stress enough how important it is to invest in these ecosystems for all the reasons that Sarah mentioned and, uh, and the infrastructure needs that we, that we continue to have. Amazing, and I think I've heard from both of you the need not only to keep the infrastructure that is in place, but to expand it. Um, to continue to uh, deepen the, I think, robustness of that infrastructure uh, by, you know, ensuring that we have uh, data, right, the equitable post-election analysis that you spoke of, uh, uh, Tristan, as well as the technology and, and other um, 
uh, infrastructure tools that we can use to to further strengthen that. Um, I want to turn to a, a, a different well, actually come back to it and not necessarily pivot, but really come back to this idea of trust. Both of you talked to both Sarah and Tristan talked about the role of relationships like and trust um, uh, that made all of this work possible, particularly trust between operators and democracy entrepreneurs. Um, but we also talked talked about trust at the highest, at the macro level, right? And, and the fact that that is currently in crisis. And this election has further highlighted for us, not only the deep political and ideological divisions that exist in our country, but also it has underscored just how our realities are shaped by the narrative un enclaves that we live in and the beliefs that we hold about who we are as a country. So reflecting on this ideological and, and social fragmentation, what do you think we need to do to build civic trust and a unified vision for our democracy? And I wanna start with you, Leila, because I know your, your work is, is squarely centered around this idea of building trust. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's such a big question. And, and I think there, there are a couple ways to approach it. Um, one thing that is clear is that we were a divided nation before the election, and we are still a divided nation after the election. And, you know, to, to use your word, I think we're also not just divided neatly in two. I think the word fragmented is actually very apt to describe the, um, the true kind of diversity of perspectives and how we're thinking about organizing ourselves into, into groups. And um, I think that's really important um, to actually identifying the problem is actually thinking about this idea of fragmentation not being two sides. Um, even within right the Democratic and Republican parties, there's a, a diversity of, of viewpoints. And so I think the, the first thing that we have to do to overcome this is really to change our mindset. Um, you can't have a constructive conversation if you assume right off the bat that the person you're talking to is the enemy. And if you're kind of grouping them into some category um, based on assumptions and, and the mindset that you have, there's a clear dichotomy of good and bad. Um, you know, that's, that's not going to lead to a constructive conversation and recognizing that problem is an important first step. You know, I'll, I'll give one example of Millennial Action Project's work is we launched a uh, the mechanism by which we kind of connect young legislatures or legislators is a caucus, right? So we'll launch a future caucus in state legislatures. And we launched one in Mississippi a couple of years ago. And one of the first things that the crew there decided that they were just not going to talk about because it was too polarizing was the state flag. But they knew it was an issue and they knew it was something that um, they just weren't going to see eye to eye on back in 2017 when we launched. Now, fast forward to this year, the investments that we had made in creating the space for those young legislators to continuously meet over the past few years, uh, building trust, as you say, Yordanos, with each other and actually believing in um, a shared sense of, um, of, of values and uh, problem solving actually led them to lead an initiative within the state house to actually remove the Confederate iconography from the from the state flag. And that's something that uh, was unanimously approved by both Republicans and Democrats in that caucus and wouldn't have been possible without really intense, grueling, hard work of bringing them together over a long period of time and, and changing their mindset from the get-go helped them get to that point. You know, the, the other thing that, that I'll say um, is that folks need to have empathy in these types of conversations. Right, we have to learn to listen, uh, which I know for a lot of us is is really hard. But to pause and and listen and resist the urge to demonize or dehumanize each other, um, and assuming the worst version of of people who might have a different viewpoint from us, and then you know we really do need to support leaders who can model, who are willing to model that behavior and and disrupt some of that dysfunction, because I think that kind of core behavior is, is really disrupting something fundamental that we're seeing as a problem in our governing institutions. And by uplifting leaders who truly believe in their hearts, um, how to have empathy, how to have these types of conversations, we start to, to see a different type of very entrepreneurial leader that then models to their community how they, um, how we deserve to behave and how we, we expect others to, to behave. Um, right now, the reality is, 
both parties have power. So if anything is going to get done, we really do have to figure out culturally how we encourage and incentivize that kind of uh, behavior and that kind of attitude. There's also some real structural fixes that uh, we can encourage folks to push in terms of making our democracy more representative, uh, making it more inclusive, encouraging more voices to, to be represented in who their elected officials are and not allowing the uh, voices of, of a few lead to a very bad and, and lopsided misrepresentation of, of the will of the people. Um, I, you know, things like gerrymandering, right, that's coming up next year. Things like government accountability, things like you know what we saw this year in, in expanding access to voting. These are all things that make it more fair and make it so that um, the the power of the many is represented right now instead of the power of the few. Vanessa, how do you think about you know what we need to do to create a, a much more unified vision for our democracy? Sure. So I I think the concept of fragmentation is, is really helpful here. Um, you know, there's gonna be polarization for quite some time. And that looks different in every state and every city and every community. And we've nationalized our politics in ways that I think have obscured what specific communities need and want and what they find compelling in terms of political solutions and sort of working through some of these deeper problems. Um, you know, we're talking a lot right now about polls and how, you know, how polls don't tell us the story of the whole country effectively. And I think that that's an important lesson here too. I don't think that um, we, that when we think about polarization, we're, we're thinking in a broad way and not a, a deep way about, about how that looks different in different places. So that's um, one reason why I think these proximate organizations are so helpful because they can help build civic trust in their own communities in ways that are meaningful and that make sense for that community. So it's not just a one size fits all. Um, we do a lot of work to combat digital disinformation, a lot of support for, for others who are working to combat that. And I think that that's a, that's a perfect example where you see these narratives spreading online and the most effective way is for these, these local community networks, people who trust each other um, to, to work together, um, almost in a way sort of policing themselves and informing themselves. I think that we, that there's a ton that we can learn from those, those localized groups and how, how they are um, responding to big problems like that. You know, I think we have a huge opportunity in this outpouring of civic engagement, um, both on the left and the right. Polarization is also, you know, the, maybe the flip side of it, we could think of as political engagement. Um, there are diverse and talented leaders emerging across the country and across the political spectrum. And I think they really have the entrepreneurship to, to look at this problem in their own communities and figure out the, the best ways to counter it. Uh, that, that absolutely resonates. And, and Vanessa, I wanna, I wanna stay on this topic of the, well, you talked about how you know, the Hula Foundation and you and your colleagues are addressing one aspect of um, the, you know, big, a big problem we have in our democracy, which is disinformation and misinformation, right? Um, we know that philanthropy has not significantly invested in our democracy space. Uh, in this election, uh, from the electoral perspective, you know, what we're seeing right now is what the reports are saying, you know, $14 billion uh, were spent on the 2020 elections alone, the most ever that has ever been spent on any election cycle. And that is 3x the amount philanthropy and philanthropists have spent on democracy organizations over the last decade. And we know that philanthropy is the engine of civil society, uh, but it is just we, philanthropy is just not investing at the at the scale that it needs, uh, similar to education or poverty alleviation or even workforce development. So, how are you and your colleagues at Hewlett uh, thinking about this? Why did you prioritize investing in our democracy? And and as a philanthropist, what is your call to action to other philanthropists to also prioritize investing in in our democracy? Sure. So. Um, Hewlett has been investing in U.S. democracy 
you know, for a very long time, but with a, a specific program for this since 2013. And it's really because we believe that strengthening democracy is central to fighting and, and dealing with all the other challenges we're looking at. So another area that, that Hewlett is really involved in is climate change. It's really important that you have strong institutions and a strong democracy in order to fight that. I think that that's clear um, really across the board in, in education reform, support for the arts and all of the other areas of work that we do. And I think that that is a lesson that, that you can generalize to other philanthropists. If you are focused on a particular cause, it's highly unlikely that you can make progress there um, when democracy is, is failing or if it's weakening. Um, you know, in terms of the call to action, I, I think that we really have to continue to support this, this overwhelming um, movement of civic engagement that we've seen. As I mentioned earlier, this free and fair election that we just saw that, you know, I, I come from a sort of more global perspective, um, having done work more on the international scale. And it's so rare and so important um, to be able to have an election like that. To assume that we, you know, we can't assume that we can call up these networks to support um, to support strong elections in the same way next time. So, one thing, as someone who's fairly new to Hewlett, that I I really respect about their approach is focusing on multi-year general operating support grants. That's really important for these organizations to continue to do the work year in year out to deliver the kinds of results. Um, a, a, as far as you know, strong performance in, in elections, um, you know, in, on the administration side and just the conduct side, um, making sure that we're clear uh, when we're working with organizations that we're comfortable with risk and we trust their judgment. We we know that they're the experts in their communities and the experts in the work that needs to be done, um, and making that clear in our words and in our actions in the way that we support them. So. Few few restrictions, um, relying on their on their judgment and really taking their taking their word for it. Very very helpful, uh, Vanessa. And I also want to get the perspective of Proxima Democracy entrepreneurs. So um, I'll start with you, uh, Sarah. You know, uh, what is your call to action for, to philanthropists? What could philanthropists do? Um, to be a force for an inclusive democracy and to support, you know, the work that you and your partners are doing. Yeah, I mean, just like class one to what Vanessa said, um, groups need multi-year general operating support um, because we need to be able to, put, to know how many staff we can keep on. We need to fill key gaps. I mean, this year is a great example of so much had to go remote, so much had to go online. And while a lot of folks are like, yeah, young people, they live online. Yes, they do. And usually digital organizing staff is one of the later hires because you're actually more focused on hiring other programmatic staff um, before you get to that comm staffer, before you get to that digital staffer. And so um, right now, you know, clearly a lot of our groups have shifted, but will we be able to afford to keep them on? The pandemic, you know, it's going to keep going for a while. We need to keep our digital staff on. We need to keep our operations staff on. We need to keep our programmatic teams on that we're able to reach so many young people this cycle. And so really making sure that we'll, we're doubling down now um, so that uh, folks can stay staff, staffed up to do this work is really important. But I think the other thing I, I want to note here is that um, the programmatic pieces are really, really important. Um, cranking stuff out is really important, but relationships are really important. And relationships, uh, making sure, especially leaders of color have the resources they need, yeah, to do the work, but also to be in relationship with one another. Um, I'm part of a really amazing group of newer executive directors of color. Uh, we gathered last October, and these are people that I've been able to lean heavily on um, to get through the many challenges of this year. This work is hard. <laughs> a lot of the challenges that we face, that, those challenges are not why we started doing this type of organizing. Um, and yet th this is, stuff that we still have to work through. And so when I think about this year, and you know, I mentioned before, we received more money than we've ever received in the past. Well, to be honest, on, on the C3 side, you know, we kind of ran out of places where we could put C3 dollars because luckily a lot of our budget gaps were filled by late summer for our entire network. And so what did I start doing? I started reaching out to friends who I knew were leading powerful work, but weren't necessarily in the same circles that I was in to just say, okay, how can I close your gaps? And we were very lucky to be able to move money to groups like Community Justice Reform Coalition, who was organizing communities who have been most impacted by gun violence to be able to turn them out in the election. We're 
able to move resources to Native Organizers Alliance, who is supporting groups across the country um, center, uh, centering um, Indigenous communities to participate in the election. Um, that happened because, uh, not because I just got to meet those folks overnight, but because of trust that had been built up over years, knowing these are my people, they're doing really great work. It's ridiculous, they still have budget gaps right now, but um, I, I, we knew that we could trust them and we knew that, and our donors knew that they could trust us to make those decisions to get those resources out the door. So the relational piece is really important, making sure it's okay and encouraged to say, yeah, go build relationships with these people. Crank the workout, we're gonna keep cranking the workout, that never stops. But the importance of prioritizing relationships is one of the biggest things that, that I take away. And, and that's part of why unrestricted funds are so important so that when there are opportunities for us to be in person, to build together, to take time to think big, um, all of that has a long-term impact on what we're able to accomplish together. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Tristan. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, you know. Leah, I think said earlier that in, that part of what's happening is a redefining of democracy. And I think what we're also learning from data is that there's a redefining of progress. And as we sort of wrestle with that to really understand uh, what is moving people, and uh, I think we'll learn more about how we should move folks. Uh, but where we sit right now, Sarah's exactly right yet again, um, what's needed is to invest in these orgs uh, in the off season. We have to take a broader look at civic engagement to understand that it doesn't end with voting, uh, but truthfully, neither does it does it begin. You know, uh, one of the things that we do, I think, Rubik's in our engagement studio of the three studios that we have, is to work with these same organizations that are doing work um, uh, in states and in smaller communities uh, on the organization development needs, training and development, really doing the work to make sure that they are well resourced and uh, and and have properly. Um, uh, equipped and then uh, developing the skill they need to be effective uh, in, in any season. Uh, but what, how much further could we go if we're able to also resource those organizations from our C3 or C4? And I think that's the opportunity cost that we continue to miss when we don't see uh, our, our, our organizations or, or you know, uh, partners properly resourced and then having to do, to Sarah's point earlier, the work of rebuilding uh, when you have instances of turnover, you have instances of infrastructure loss uh, and other funding gaps. So I think those are some of the more, those are, those are the sort of the things I would, I would lift up. And I think finally, um, you know, it's important to know that we're actually not done with our voter work. <laughs> and this is going to run right into accountability season with, you know, we'll be very much active in Georgia with those uh, state-based Senate runoffs. And there are actually quite a few local races in some of these states. Uh, that are having runoffs for mayor, runoffs for uh, other really important um, uh, uh, seats and positions. And these organizations are doing that work still while they're preparing for end of the year reports and you know getting strategies together for accountability season. Uh, so they really can't afford to be underfunded or have gaps or not be in a position to do the work effectively. And I think that's sort of you know how we should understand um, uh, the impact of off-cycle, off-season investment and the real expansive nature of civic engagement work that, to Vanessa's point, um, uh, uh, helps us to tackle other issues um, and advance policy that changes material conditions um, all around the country, you know, and it really is quite local. You know, we don't have one national election. We have 50 state elections and several county executives and, and election officials who are doing the work. And I think it'd be a shame if we uh, uh, weren't able to capitalize on the trust that we've done to rebuild um, uh, that faith in democracy by also establishing trust in, in governance, good governance. Thank you, Tristan. Really quickly, uh, Layla, and then I think we, we have some questions from our audience we wanna be able to get to for the last few minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I, I would just underline everything Vanessa, Tristan, and Sarah said. I could not agree more. I think this, this work of democracy is a force multiplier for every issue you care about. And so that is, you know, it's not a risky bet, it's it's the best bet you could make um, to invest in, in the container in which all of these other issues live. Um, you know, I love Tristan saying that but that voting is, is uh, a comma, not a period. I think that, you know, our philanthropists shouldn't just look at elections as the moment to, to invest. Um, our, our team at Millennial Action Project volunteered at a food bank here in DC last, uh, last November. 
and we had such a great experience. We said, we, you know, we want to come back. Like, when should we sign up to come? And they told us, please don't sign up for the holidays. Like we have hungry people in March, in April, in May. And, you know, we can't just pay attention when, when it's convenient for us, when there's all of the intention. Um, we have to come when nobody's looking. We have to show up when um, in the Marches and in the, in the Aprils of the democracy season. Um, and, and just finally, you know, I think that investments in, um, in diverse youth-led organizations are so important. It's a cohort that's only getting bigger, that's only getting more important that we've already seen in this cycle has tremendous power. You know, Millennial Action Project tracked a 266% increase in young candidates alone, not to mention the historic voter turnout we saw. So, you know, I think this is a group that is only growing in power. And um, there are groups there that are out there right now doing the work to mobilize, engage them, build trust with them. And, you know, I think it, it is good for the whole ecosystem to make sure that we um, continue to invest in those groups. Amazing. Lots of incredible nuggets, including we need to address this bust and boom cycle. We need to build infrastructure. Uh, we're not only redefining democracy, but we're redefining how the work happens and how we measure progress. And, and last but not least, we need to uh, trust and support network building and relationship building uh, with leaders, both at the local level and national level. So thank you so much for this incredible discussion. I'm going to turn it to Juliet. I know we're running out of time. Maybe we have time to do one or two questions. Okay. Thank you, Adonis, and, and, and to all of you speaking. Uh, that was a fantastic conversation. Um, I'm going to jump straight into a couple of questions. Um, Jerry Roll, if you're there, uh, let's unmute Jerry because uh, he had a great question around uh, people in the in the rural rural uh, rural space. Um, Jerry, hi. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. This has been great. Um, but if I remain frustrated um, as a rural white person, um, and frustrated is not the right word anymore, it's kind of embarrassed. Um, rural people voted based on who they see and who sees them. Um, and there doesn't just doesn't seem to be much investment in rural across the board. Um, and if all we ever see is Sean Hannity and Fox News, that's who sees us. Um, so how can, how do we work to link the fate of particularly, I think we need to center racial equity, but we need to help rural places understand that our fate is linked. How can we, how can we work harder to do that? How can we convince philanthropy that that's important and we need to do that? Um, or do we need to do that? Who wants to take that one? Thank you, Jerry. Great question. I can jump in real quickly to just highlight uh, an organization that I um, I love and adore, and they're called We the People Michigan. And it's led by um, a Latino man named Art Reyes, whose family has been in Flint, Michigan for years. And he's built out this um, network, this model where they do really deep organizing um, with working class people across Michigan. And yes, that includes rural white voters in the UP in particular. And they're one of the first organizations in Michigan that has been very intentional by doing outreach to white communities, to communities of color, and bringing people together as, as basically working class folks trying to make change. And racial justice is, is centered in their work and they don't negotiate any of that away. And they are they led really powerful work um, this, this election uh, cycle in Michigan um, helped lead to some really uh, exciting change in Michigan. I'm trying to keep C3 here. Um, but um, I'm gonna drop their link in, in the chat here because I think there's a, uh, We the People has only existed for a few years. And so I think they're a really powerful model of what is possible to still center racial justice, but do outreach to communities in urban and rural communities alike. Thank you for that great question, Jerry. And, and I was also going to, to say, if you are, for anyone on here, thinking about your philanthropic efforts right now and the strategies that you want to take uh, now and beyond this year, um, we can connect you with, with, um, with people at New Profit if you just like a, a consultation on, on, on the approach to take. So do reach out to either me or community at worth.com and we can connect you with that. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, we're out of time, but we will capture uh, some of the other questions coming in. And thank you so much for uh, the engagement. Uh, also love seeing uh, just in your comments from your experience in the UK as well compared to the US. 
Um, and I, I would just like to say, Vanessa, Sarah, Layla, and Tristan, thank you so much for such an insightful and timely uh, and thought provoking discussion uh, around um, the transformation of democracy. And a huge thank you to you, your Danis, for brilliantly moderating the session, uh, as well as a special thank you to the new profit team, to, Sa to Sam, Sarah, Lizzie, and the team for being a partner in this series. Uh, and most importantly, thanks to all of you that tuned in today. Um, you can register for all the sessions in this series online at worth.com forward slash event. Join us for the next session of this series next Wednesday, November 18th at 3 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be, using, we'll be talking about using a new lens to see and invest in transform transformative change in healthcare, uh, another very timely subject with some great special guests. So uh, please do register for that if you haven't done already. And in the meantime, be kind, stay healthy, stay well, uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Bye.